Hey everybody, good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland's 12th Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Oh yeah. I'm Dan Malthrop, I'm the Chief Executive here at the City Club. I'm also your host for today's induction ceremony. Since our first induction in 1985, the City Club has recognized 31 outstanding members of our community. These people have met two criteria for nomination, and those criteria are the following. They must be a member of the City Club of Cleveland and have made a significant contribution to our organization. And beyond that, they must also have made a significant contribution to the community. You'll find a complete list of past inductees in the printed program, and I think you'll find two that today's inductees meet those criteria with flying colors. We're here to bestow this important recognition on six individuals who have dedicated an incredible amount of time, talent, and resources, and energy, and attention, all of which has helped to shape the City Club into the diverse free speech forum that it is today. The selection process by the Hall of Fame, for Hall of Fame nominations was led by City Club past president and a 51-year member Bob Lustig, along with a committee comprised of city club, other City Club past presidents and members. Could the members of the Hall of Fame nominating committee please stand to be recognized? There were women involved too, which should be noted, but they're not here today. Um, <laughs> So we are going to get started here with the inductions. Everybody's going to um, get a chance to, to say a few words. Those who are inducting are going to say a few words about those who are being inducted. Those who are being inducted will say a few words and then take a, a seat on the stage. And after we get through everybody, it's a city club forum, so we'll have a QA. and a And we look forward to you participating in that. And at that point, you can ask questions of everyone. They'll have 30 seconds to respond. And then an opposing, oh no, this isn't a debate. Okay. <laughs> At this time, though, it's my pleasure to invite City Club Board Vice President and the Chair of our Programming Committee, Judy Feniger, to the podium to introduce our first inductee, Len Calabrese. Thanks, Dan, and welcome to everybody. What a nice City Club day this is today. Sun is shining, and congratulations to all of the inductees. Uh, we're, today we'll pay tribute to Ralph Hayes, to the legendary Judge Capers, who I just got to meet, so my day is complete. Uh, Jim Foster, who was at the helm here during most of my years of involvement, and my dear friends Sally and Bob Grease, so really a nice day. But I'm here to induct Len Calabrese, and it's always a happy moment when you pick up the phone and Len Calabrese is on the other end of the phone, because you know it's going to be something interesting and you're probably going to be asked to do something. Um, and sure enough, I couldn't have been more pleased a month or so ago when Len called me and uh, very honored that he invited me to induct him into this Hall of Fame. While Len is a fixture in this room, you might have noticed he's not with us today and there are very few things that would have kept he and Dottie away, but I understand that they're in Beijing on a uh, trip that was long planned and Phil even mentioned that Len did look into whether he could change the trip to be here, but um, that wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't able to do that, and I'm sure to his great regret. Len's one of those people who engages you the minute that you meet him and becomes a lifelong friend. His work has influenced so much of what happens in this community, um, and if you know him, you probably know that he's an avid traveler, that he is a voracious reader. You might know some other things about him, and you can read them in your program, many other accomplishments a proud Italian-American, graduate of Benedictine High School and John Carroll University. And you may have heard of him during his decades of work on social justice, interfaith issues, peace issues, and equality. He was a tenured associate professor of social sciences at the University of Akron for more than a decade, and for even longer directed social justice initiatives for the Diocese of Cleveland. When I was executive director of the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage, as Bob and Sally know, we had a very strong focus on outreach to other faiths and cultures. So of course, Len was a part of that. Of more than a dozen major national exhibitions we had during my time there, two of my very favorite were programs in collaboration with the Catholic community, Women in Spirit and a Blessing to One Another. 
And of course, Len was uh, very involved. He'd been a part of the lead staff of Bishop Pilla's nationally recognized church in the city and then was president of the Catholic Community Connection from which he retired, retired in 2013. But we're at the City Club today, and Len's been such a stalwart City Club member. He joined in 1988, chaired the program committee, which I now chair, from 1990 to 2001, and at that point became president of the board. And he remains an active, contributing member of that committee, and he always has ideas for us. I recently asked him about his decades of memorable speakers at the club, particularly during his presidency, and the first thing he mentioned was that his presidency spanned 9-11 uh, and the aftermath. And the, just we talked about the anxiety and chaos. I was at the Red Cross at the time. And Jim will remember that the Honorable Tommy Thompson, who was then US Secretary of Health and Human Services, was scheduled to be our speaker on Friday, September 14th that week, and of course, canceled. So, uh, you know, we had to figure out, and Jim and Len and some others had to really figure out not just what to do immediately, but amid all the anxiety and chaos, think about what, think thoughtfully about what to do during the morning. And Len was proud that the City Club kept going, pulling together a panel on responding to tragedy with just a few days' notice to help communicate the magnitude of the crisis response underway and how people could help, because people really wanted to know how they could help. He was also proud of catalyzing a series of programs on redeveloping Cleveland, which began our practice of packaging forums together in series. And more recently, he enjoyed serving on the Centennial Book Committee, which helped produce a century of free speech commemorating our first 100 years. He's served our community, again, in too many ways to mention, and please do look in your program to see what some of that, them are. Um, and we still work together on the Abrahamic Council of Notre Dame College, so I get to see him here and at other places, and it's always a joy. So please join me in sending vibes of peace and love to Len as he becomes a member of a City Club Hall of Fame. Len and Dottie have two sons, Thad and Phil, and Phil, who's also a City Club and program member, will accept on his behalf if you'll join me. Thank you. As uh, Judy mentioned, I'm not Len Calabrese, and uh, I know he wishes very much to be here. He did prepare these remarks, though, and asked the, uh, me to read them for him. First and foremost, he says, I want to thank the entire City Club of Cleveland for this honor. I'm deeply appreciative. It means so much to me because the City Club means so much to me. It is a jewel in the constellation of organizations which made Greater Cleveland such a special place. Needless to say, I'm very sorry that I am unable to be there in person with so many family, friends, and colleagues, as well as my fellow inductees, all of whom I respect so much and all of whom have contributed so much to the City Club and to our community. I have been blessed to know and work with tremendous people at the City Club. Most recently, that was certainly true with the Centennial Book Committee where I had the privilege to work regularly with Rick Taft, Bob Lustig, Dennis Dooley, Jim Foster, Dan Malthrop, Mike Grimaldi, and our author, Carol Poe. I fondly recall so many others who encouraged me along the way. Alan Davis, Stanley Edelstein, Ion Biggs, Peter DeLeon, and Seth Taft. These and so many others make up a cavalcade of city club and civic greats, famous and not so famous, all committed to the common good. For me, the City Club has always been a place not only to discuss important issues, but to find common ground so that we can all engage and enhance the common good. It is a place to advance civil discourse and civic dialogue as a way to counter the seductions of cynicism and excessive individualism. At a time when so many are struggling to have their voices heard, I think the City Club is more necessary than ever. Thank you so much for this meaningful recognition. It just deepens the special place the City Club will always hold in my heart. Thank you.
Thank you, Philip, very much, and uh, for accepting that award on, on behalf of your father. It, Len has really helped us all so much here at the City Club. He continues to, and Judy's not lying when she says it's always fun to get a phone call from Len Calabrese. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, to invite Philip Morris, uh, who you know from the pages of The Plain Dealer and from uh, the, the web pages of Cleveland.com, to introduce our next inductee, Judge Jean Morrell Capers. Good afternoon. Congratulations to um, all of those who are being honored. What a terrific, terrific award and honor. And I'm so happy to be a part of this. Um, anyone who's read the pages of The Plain Dealer in recent years know exactly how I feel about Jean Merle Capers. <laughs> I, I think she's amazing. She's an amazing woman. Um, when, they, when I was asked to uh, say some remarks about her, I, I didn't know where to start. I have so many stories, stories that I've shared uh, with my daughter about the judge. In fact, the, the only reason why the judge and I are friends is because she fell in love with my daughter uh, before we became friends. But anyway, roughly 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to introduce Jean Merle Capers to an audience somewhat different than the one that's assembled here today. That audience was composed mostly of children, students from the Mary McLeod Bethune Elementary School, a Cleveland public school that rests in the heart of Glenville. My introduction for the judge was simple. Please listen to her important stories and learn. Ask her questions about anything that you would like to know about the history of Cleveland or the history of Mary McLeod Bethune. Judge Capers was a friend of the famous woman for whom your school is named, I said, before handing off the microphone. For nearly the next hour, Jean Capers held court in the way only she can. I watched with fascination as not only the school's faculty but students seemed to hang on to every word and to delight in her rich anecdotal stories. She brought Mary Bethune, the legendary educator and civil rights activist, back to life in a way no other Clevelander could. For the judge, the historical reflection was personal. Her memories were crisp and detailed. There are few things that the judge has long enjoyed more than mentoring students and seeking to empower young women in particular. Jean Capers is hard to take your eyes off. She was born to lead, illuminate, and to issue orders. There are a few things that the judge has long enjoyed more than mentoring students and seeking to empower young women in particular. A city has watched for the better part of almost 70 years as Judge Capers has dreamed seemingly impossible dreams and then made them a reality. People told her that she, a Negro woman, could never be elected to Cleveland City Council. Naysayers said that America's fifth largest city wasn't ready for the sort of social experimentation she represented. She strongly begged to differ. She knew that if she got people to register to vote and then got them to actually go to the polls on election days, she could win. She knew that she had the right message and she had done the math. She also knew that if she followed her father's constant advice to always think before acting, there was nothing that she could not achieve if she put in the hard work. She ran on a platform partially dedicated to improving the quality of garbage pickup services in a central neighborhood. The service at that time was awful. Rodents were omnipresent and too many children were being bitten and sickened by vermin. In 1948, she upset the apple cart. She became the first woman of color elected to council. She won despite the editorial objections of the city's three leading newspapers. She won because of her ex extreme confidence in herself and her faith in the voting public. She won because she was determined to stop the scourge of young children in Central being bitten by rats. Council was just a launching pad for a public life of service. Her public service included a stretch as an assistant attorney general and later as a Cleveland municipal judge. But there is so much more to Jean Capers than the esteemed offices and positions she has held. It's the quiet behind the scenes leadership and mentoring that truly distinguishes Judge Capers in a way that many Clevelanders fail to totally appreciate. In recent years, I have written quite frequently about Judge Capers in my Plain Dealer column. After each column, I can always count on receiving numerous letters or phone calls from people throughout the region. The correspondence comes from people who revere the judge. They tell me how she inspired them to pursue their dreams. These, mostly women of different races, ages, and backgrounds are universal in their undying 
admiration and affection for Judge Jean Capers. But this is nothing new. People cheer for Jean Capers because she has long been a cheerleader in her own right. When a young Ohio State representative named Carl Stokes began to consider the possibility of running for mayor in the early 1960s, Jean Capers was one of the people that strongly cheered him on. But more than cheering on the charismatic Stokes, she was also one of his important strategists, a behind the scenes number cruncher. She was part of a cadre of analysts that assured Stokes that mayor was not an impossible dream. The matter that obviously sets the, be the beloved Jean Capers apart from many others who have joined us on this journey, obviously though, is her longevity. Several years ago, I helped her clean out her law office on Prospect Avenue. She had decided at the age of 97 to call it quits. <laughs> it was an extremely tough decision for her, but in her heart, she must have believed it was the correct decision. The cramped office was a literary, literal museum of dusty old law filings, decades old phone books, awards, memorabilia, and dated correspondence. Buried in a bottom drawer of a desk was a letter with the seal of the state of Ohio on the envelope and the stationery. It was from the late Governor Jim Rhodes, who had first appointed her to an unexpired term on the Cle Cleveland Municipal Court. The letter was short and to the point. Thank you for your extraordinary service. You are an inspiration to many. That sums it up quite well. But those of us who have had the pleasure of her company know that she is so much more. She is a matriarchal figure unlike Cleveland has ever seen. She was here in 1920 when the Cleveland Indians defeated the Brooklyn Robins to win the World Series. <laughs> she was here in 1918 when the Cleveland Orchestra was founded. She was here in 1916 when the doors to the Cleveland Museum were opened for the first time. More importantly, she's here today. Please help me in welcoming the incomparable Jean Capers. Thank you very much. I'm not the breath taken. Rather, my breath has not been taken because of that masterful essay that was given. <laughs> but I want to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Morris for um, my having been able to make that kind of impression <laughs> on him. But. I want to thank all of you who are here because of your interest in the City Club over a period of time and uh, continuing its presence in the city of Cleveland. To my mind, ever since I heard speakers on the public square that I learned from their background, they were members of the City Club, then I wanted to be a member of the City Club because I knew the names of Sally and Bob Grease. I didn't pronounce it that way. Grease, uh, from reading about it in the press and the plane dealer and the news because they were the three real newspapers that we had in the city of Cleveland because of the editors of each one of them individually. Even though the uh, press was the, no, the news was the afternoon newspaper of the plain dealer. But it was the men, not the women, who were the editors 
of those papers and who made up the uh, editorial division of those newspapers that helped to make Cleveland the greatest city in the United States, it's, but because it was the greatest uh, city in the greatest uh, country in the United States, the United States of America. That's why I knew I was the best. Uh, I learned it from the uh, newspapers and from my parents. Uh, my sister is here. Stand up, Alice, the baby sister. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And her first born, her first born, attorney Paul Merle Rose of San Francisco now. <laughs> we were graduates, uh, Alice and I, and my two brothers were graduated, graduates of Central High School, the oldest school west of the Allegheny Mountains. Therefore, it made it the best. <laughs> And so, so when there was talk about you not being the same as anybody else, that went right over my head because uh, our parents had taught us not to waste time on foolishness and trivia because we were the best, uh, because they were the best, and they were our parents. And they had b been born in one in Kentucky, Papa, and Mama in Ohio where we were li living at the time. My father had brought five children and his wife to Cleveland, the best location in the nation, uh, in order for us to um, get the benefit of an integrated education because he had uh, been educated in a segregated system, born in Kentucky. But Kentucky has always been a proud state and a high state, even in the lowest uh, capabilities. Uh, get a Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Sanders, not just an ordinary soldier, but an officer, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> That's what uh, Kentucky stands for. And so uh, it's always a sad occasion it has been when people are going back to get to where we are now because they're not here. And they were the ones, impossible, as far as myself, for anybody to have been able to do all the things that people say uh, that I was responsible for. That's impossible for one person. <laughs> there had to be. I have better sense than that, and taught by my mother and father. And so I've appreciated the last article that Mr. Morris wrote. And you know, he didn't tell me he was writing any of these articles. We would just be meeting down at Shays at 40 in St. Clair where I ran into him. But I always remind him, if he hadn't had that s smart little Negro girl <laughs> sitting beside him, I wouldn't have even known who he was. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> That's the truth. Because, uh, and I have to tell it, because uh, she's so smart, and I'd lived long enough to know that woman didn't amount to anything until 1920, when, and she had to fight in order to be considered a citizen. So you're not anything if you're not a citizen of the greatest state greatest country in the United States, and my father and mother both born here, I can't be anything else but great. Right. So uh, that was no surprise to me, but mm -hmm. I had to learn that different people had different ideas about what contribution they wanted to make in their own life. And uh, because I had started eating at Shays, 40th and, and St. Clair, because it was on the way downtown. And there were a number of persons. I went there because I understood people needed to be educated 
as far as Negroes were concerned, and they only knew one kind, the kind that they didn't want to be uh, citizens, but uh, I just knew it was because of their ignorance. And they were people, just like everybody else, and uh, made contributions in different ways. And they had booze in it, just like the average neighborhood re restaurant. And there are other persons coming in, Negroes, and, and whatever the nationality was. I didn't go by nationality. I went by the way you treated me and whether or not you were smart. Uh, because my father taught us, the five children of us, that uh, you were the best because you were born in the best country in the world. And I lived it up. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Wait, I haven't finished saying it. I have to tell them goodbye. It's me. It's me. Oh. Hi. 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 How are you doing? Good. <laughs> it's me. Here, he's yeah. going to finish We have a, a very special uh, presentation. Your Honor, you didn't tell me about it. I know, I know. It's just, it was just, it was just sprung on us. It's from the uh, Republican Party of Cuyahoga County. Oh. It's a proclamation in honor of Judge Jean M. Capers in recognition of your induction in the City Club of Cleveland Hall of Fame, and a lifetime of contributions to the Republican Party in Cuyahoga County. Signed, Rob Frost, Chairman of the RPCC. Well, th I appreciate that. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Sam. Thank you. Thank you for it. But I was determined that I was going to uh, uh, be a member of uh, the uh, city club because I heard the speakers down on Public Square. Anybody could speak. Public Square, you know where you pass almost every day if you have business downtown? Well, any day, any time of the day, you could pass by and people, would, somebody would be out there speaking and so, or somebody would be out there playing the violin. That's important history as far as the city of Cleveland is concerned and the kind of people that uh, made the city great. Uh, I uh, am honored to be considered for this award along with the persons who uh, I'm, con I'm uh, uh, inducted with. And uh, two of them are Bob and Sally Rees. And I knew them the least. I knew them the least in all our work because they came from me and their families that Cleveland was uh, uh, built by. And, but they were always in everything. And I said, if I get a chance uh, to know about some organization that they are members of, I am going to see about being a member <laughs> because, because they, ne they need me just like I need them. That's true. Thank you so much. Your Honor, thank you. We'll hold on to that. Yeah. Right. You can have a seat yeah. on the stage. All right. And Mr. Foster, I, I wanted to say hello to you because you made the city club for me. Indeed. Philip, thank you, and, and Your Honor, thank you so much for your words. Um, you are an inspiration to all of us. And uh, you know, this woman actually last year came down to renew her membership in person. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Next up, we have the inimitable Rick Taft, also a member of the City Club Hall of Fame himself, to introduce our next inductee, my predecessor, the former executive director of the City Club of Cleveland, Jim Foster. Rick. I was not informed of the order of events until today because nobody told me ahead of time I was going to have to follow you, Judge Capers. <laughs> now, if I'd known that, I would have worn my cowboy hat. Sometimes history moves with the force of a tide, steady 
inexorable, the outcome clear. Sometimes history places us on a knife edge, a sharp divide between possible outcomes. On a knife edge, balance matters, speed matters, fate is on the move. In 1992, Jim Foster was looking for a new challenge. He had served both Cleveland and Cuyahoga County as a community relations officer. He had served his country for more than a decade as a mission-ready jet fighter pilot in the Air National Guard. He had, since 1979, served the general public as a senior member of the team that brought the National Air Show to Cleveland. When a friend called Jim to say the City Club was going to hire a new director, Jim concluded the call politely, pressed his finger down on the button in the telephone cradle, remember, right? To get a new dial tone and called the number he already knew for the City Club. It was late in the process, he was told, the field had already begun to narrow, but he, he could apply. In November of that year, almost 23 years ago, exactly today, Jim received a letter from the president of the club, Scott Feinerman. Dear Mr. Foster, thank you for your interest in our new position of managing director at the City Club. Your application was much appreciated and was read carefully. By each of four members of a special subcommittee of our search committee, you were among the nearly 160 talented and experienced people, people who applied for the job. Unfortunately, the screening process indicated you were not among the 10 who have been selected for further interviews. Disappointed, Jim wrote back to share the research he had been conducting with club assistants into the membership demographics and important opportunities he had noticed to retain members past a critical two-year window to win their enduring loyalty and long-term membership. Hmm, thought Bruce Akers and Homer Wadsworth and Scott Feinerman. Maybe we could add an 11th person to that interview list. <laughs> Three months later, Jim received another letter from Scott. It began, this will summarize the discussion the executive committee of the City Club had with you earlier this week regarding your imminent employment as manager and director of the club. Jim has shared with me from his City Club memorabilia other letters too. Letters? Remember letters? You good with that? The letters he shared sparkle like Micah Brighton's stones on a beach and bring alive the spirit of his 20 years at the helm. Richard Pogue writes, thank you so much for your generous letter of March 21st. It made it all seem worthwhile. As you know, I was originally very reluctant to become involved in the City Club activities because for a long time, I shared the view of many that it had lost its way and had become a solo voice for left-wing causes. But my experience as a trustee in the last few years has been very satisfying. The City Club has reestablished an overarching commitment to free speech per se. This is wonderful and something I can relate to strongly. Lou Stokes writes, under the date of January of June 12, 1998, you wrote me one of the nicest letters I have ever received. I appreciate all of your warm and kind remarks. What did Jim say to elicit such a response from a congressman who had received over the years more than a few nice letters? History tantalizes with such questions, but often leaves us guessing about the actors in the drama. We do not need to guess about Jim. We know the man and we know his gist. We have the pleasure of his continued company. Retired now to bike riding and community service, he remains an avatar of this club. He radiates still the impresario's awareness that the show's the thing. And not just the show on the stage, but the whole show. He knows that it takes good programming, good food, good phone work, and an always friendly staff to put 
pardon the expression, but it's one that he uses, butts in the seats. <laughs> in his favorite metaphor, the staff builds the 90% of the iceberg that is invisible below the water so that the busy public can arrive and enjoy the swirl of ideas as speaker and audience together create the program, the 10% of the iceberg that rises to view. What a 20-year show he staged. For me, the pinnacle of Jim's run was the foreign policy extravaganza of 2004. Three past and future secretaries of state, Condi Rice, Henry Kissinger, Madeleine Albright, a man with a passion for an open society, George Soros, global paladin, Richard Holbrook, fiery critic, Joseph Wilson, angry at the outing of his CIA wife, Cleveland's own Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley, a female African-American consul general posted to Jeddah, South, Saudi Arabia. Jim Foster let history speak through the speakers. He has not sought honor, but it has sought him. Fate will not shout his accomplishments from the rooftops, but it will whisper in his ear, you have served the cause of free speech well, you are a success. We are honored to invite Jim Foster to the podium so we, we may induct him into the City Club Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thanks, Rick, for that wonderful introduction. As, uh, well, first of all, uh, Dan has asked me to do a brief review of all of the speakers who were here during my 20 years. Uh, so, uh, as most of you know, I'm much more comfortable uh, on the other side of the podium in the part of the room where you are. I've always found it much more valuable to listen and hear what someone else has to say. And I've certainly had a splendid opportunity over the past 20 years. I have enormous affection and respect for this place, for this room, for this podium. Yes, it's because of the people who have stood here, not just over the past two, dec two decades during which I had the privilege to schedule the speakers, but over our remarkable 100 plus year history. Even more important, however, is the very idea of the City Club. The idea captured so well by Ralph Hayes, who's also being honored here today in his creed of the City Club. This is a place where bias dwindles. Isn't that quaint? Bias dwindles. While here, I saw that idea, that creed, carried out so many times and so often through our renowned question and answer period, <laughs> where everyone has an opportunity to ask their own questions, unfiltered, in their own words. Stanley Edelstein's question to President Bush. Ion Biggs' question to Secretary Albright. Dan Rather's question to Bill Silverman. Yes. 60 Minutes had to sneak Dan Rather into our uh, forum that day because they couldn't get an interview. <laughs> Mike Wallace. <laughs> and Jerry Newell Holmes questioned to Archbishop Tutu. <laughs> week in and week out, it was great speakers followed by that marvelous exchange with the audience. But this city club, this wholly uncensored forum, as wonderful as that idea is, is not a very common place. There are a few similar organizations in other cities, San Francisco, Dallas, Denver, Gainesville, Detroit, but none quite like us. Some have their questions written down and read by a moderator. Some have strictly business-oriented speakers, but our club, this City Club of Cleveland, is pretty unique. It is truly a gift to our community, nurtured over the decades and going strong. So here I am, on this side of the podium and being inducted into the City Club Hall of Fame. What an honor. 
And there are some remarkable people up in the wall, many of whom I had the privilege to know and work with. So I truly appreciate the significance today. I'm joining Peter DeLeon, Tom Campbell, Bert Gardner, Lou Stokes, Bob Conrad, Chester Gray, Larry Robinson, Dick Pogue, Rick and Ann, Seth Taft, Reverend Otis Moss, Jenny Brown, so many, and of course the people being inducted today. It's quite a list, and what binds us all together is our love for this institution. And of course, I want to thank some other people who have made it possible for me to be here. So now this is fun, uh, Rick alluded to this. I want to point out someone in the audience who played that significant role in my being here today 20 years ago when I was ending my air show business and needed to make one of those midlife career changes, I had the great good fortune to have a lifelong friendship with Ralph Dice, who owns an executive search firm, Dice and Company. So I was working with Ralph and I didn't have any idea of what I was going to do next. One day the phone rang, it was Ralph and he said, I heard Alan Davis is gonna be retiring for the city club and as Rick said, I didn't even hang up the phone before calling to find out how to apply. Ralph, thank you. And there are those very special people who take on the important role of serving on the Board of Trustees, and especially those who have served as presidents. During my year as the president, also introduced the speaker every week, an enormous task. The City Club and I were most fortunate to have the commitment and support of these men and women, and several are here today. Dan recognized them earlier, but I would like to add my personal thanks. Working with each of you was a privilege and made my time here both productive and enjoyable. I had the good fortune during these years of working with colleagues who are really terrific people. Part of this <laughs> City Club Hall of Fame plaque belongs to each of them, the staff that I worked with. There are too many to name all, but I want to especially mention Gary Musselman and Catalina Caraballa, who were here almost as long as I've been here. <laughs> And Mickey Kennedy, who's probably in the back somewhere, and Mike Cromaldi and Julie Kelly. So it's been a real treat working with all of you. And my family, especially Janet. Janet, stand up. You were mostly understanding about some of the late nights <laughs> or weekends before an especially big event. And of course, probably too often, you had to hear about that day's excellent speaker, but you put up with it all, in large part, I think, because you knew how much I love this place. So thank you. And my two sons, one of whom is here today, Andrew Foster, <laughs> and my other son, my younger son, Matthew, who's away at college, he's a junior at Miami. So guys, thank you very much. So uh, retirement is terrific. I'm riding my bike a lot, as Rick said, and I'm helping Bob Papinetti with his work at the Literacy Cooperative. They've been terrific work, and you all should know more about it. And I do come occasionally to a city club forum. And when I do, people ask me, what do I miss most about the city club? The answer is easy. It's very easy. It's the people in this room, the friends I've made. It's all of you on that side of the podium. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much. Um, I often wonder, you know, people forget what it's, what the, the era that Jim presided over. And they started on um, typewriters with carbon copies of letters, no doubt. And, um, and it was only two years ago that, uh, that he handed the reins over. So thank you very much, Jim, for everything you've done. And now it's my great pleasure to invite Steve Minter to the podium to introduce our next inductees. The first time we've inducted a pair, and it's a beautiful pair, Sally and Bob Grease. Steve? It's a real pleasure for me to be able to uh, make this introduction. 
The City Club's 75th anniversary book, America's Soapbox, refers to the type of persons it hopes to attract to club membership. Participatory citizens, those who get involved in the affairs of their community, in asking tough questions, and in proposing solutions to difficult dilemmas. And this ceremony honors City Club members <coughs> who've made a significant contribution to the organization and the community who merit membership in the City Club Hall of Fame. I'm pleased, therefore, to have the opportunity to present for induction Bob and Sally Grease, a couple with a larger sense of purpose. Let me repeat, a couple with a larger sense of purpose. Two persons of moral courage, good humor, and humility who use their voices and resources to improve the quality of life in Greater Cleveland. Bob and Sally are fixtures in the civic life of this community and have been for many years. In fact, as many of you well know, Bob's family roots extend back to Cleveland's earliest days, and the Grease family has always been near the center of the community's development. That family tree <coughs> dates back to 1837, when Bob's great-great-grandfather was Cleveland's first Jewish settler. One ancestor was Rabbi Moses J. Grease of the Temple, leader of Cleveland's largest reform Jewish congregation. Not exactly coincidentally, Rabbi Grease was a member of the first board of directors of Cleveland's City Club. Now I want to talk a little bit about my friend Sally, whom I still remember the first time I ever met her. I'm sure she doesn't remember that. And it was at a Phyllis Wheatley Association board meeting when we were talking about trying to find ways to get more scholarship funds so children could go to camp Mueller in the Cuyahoga Valley National Recreation, what is now the Cuyahoga Valley National Recreation Area. She's always been someone trying to help others. And significantly for me, who Dolly and I have three girls who we keep watching them advance and advance. Well, Sally broke the glass ceiling of investment banking and financial services. And she started her own company and started a real estate investment advisory firm. In fact, she founded the first woman-owned investment management financial planning business in the state of Ohio. And in 1975, when I had the privilege of joining the Cleveland Foundation as a staff member, I watched as she and Will York Newman organized the International Women's Year Conference that brought 50,000 people to Cleveland's Convention Center over three days. And I watched and marveled at her leadership as the chair of the women's law firm, which broke new ground in Cleveland, irritated many persons, had cases that went to the United States Supreme Court who said, move over men, it's time to begin to change things in this town and in this nation. In her own words, never invite me anywhere unless you mean it because I will say yes. I love to travel and enjoy dressage, skiing, hiking, photography, and gardening. I have a special interest in education, 
horticultural and preserving the environment. And believe me, she has said yes to numerous organizations, and I only include some of the most recent, the Holden Arboretum, Hawkins School, Case Western Reserve University, Town Hall, the Cleveland Foundation, where she shares a very significant distinction because her husband, Bob, was also a member of the Cleveland Foundation's board in the 70s, and also her work with University Hospital. Both Sally and Bob have received numerous awards for their leadership and philanthropy. Bob, a retired venture capitalist, former minority owner of the Cleveland Browns, <laughs> we wish he'd come back. <laughs> and a man with a lust for adventure. You know, his lust for adventure is like my reading a comic book, you know, watching all of the things that Bob has done over the years. He's the author of a new book, which I highly commend to you, called Five Generations, 175 Years of Love for Cleveland, which was released last year. Now, Bob has completed more than 75 worldwide adventures, including a one-week running event in the Sahara Desert, a thousand-mile bike ride across the Gobi Desert, and climbs of the highest mountains in Antarctica, the Arctic, and, and, and the Andes. But I also understand that some of the places he's gone has been at, at Sally's suggestion, so she could go to the spa <laughs> and shop in the right places. Bob served on the boards of the Cleveland Foundation, the Grant Makers Forum here in, in, in Cleveland that morphed into the Ohio Grant Makers Forum, nationally was a board member and national membership chairman of the Council on Foundations, and was one of those persons who began to bring diversity, in fact, to the board of the Council on Foundations. Here locally, he's done many things, but what stands out in my mind as a very important thing for us in this community, he co-chaired the commission, which recommended the bond issue, which we passed to improve the Cleveland public school buildings. Bob Grease believes people need to find their own direction when it comes to giving and being philanthropic. If they pick the thing they are the most passionate about, they will be more generous and steadfast. The couple and their family have been generous when it comes to building community and investing in the power of ideas and institutions. For the record, the first annual Robert D. Grease Lecture of the Cleveland Foundation, now held annually, held, started in 2000, and the speaker at that occasion was Dr. Robert Putnam, author of Bowling Alone, who also spent time on this stage. The chair in cancer research at University Hospital and the Ireland Cancer Center. The endowed Sally Grease Nursing Endowment Fund to recognize individual nursing achievement. The City Club annual Sally Grease Endowed Forum in honor of women of achievement. The City Club annual Robert D. Grease Forum on inspiration. The City Club Lucille D. and Robert Hayes Grease Forum on cultural arts. Earlier, I referred to them as being, having a larger sense of purpose. Harold Shapiro, former president of the University of Michigan and Princeton, wrote in 2005, and I quote, universities like other social institutions and even individuals ought to serve interests that include but move beyond narrow self-serving concerns. I believe that Bob and Sally Grease are individuals and a couple whose lives and contributions to the community have moved far beyond narrow, self-serving concerns. 
they function daily with a larger sense of purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in recognizing Bob and Sally Grease. Thank you, Steve, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to um, thank the City Club for this wonderful, unexpected honor. Bob and I are absolutely thrilled to be included among the other inductees, and I'd like to congratulate all the other inductees also today. It's a real honor to be here. Um, the City Club has meant a lot to us over the years. Uh, as philanthropists, we take our philanthropy very seriously. It's personal to us. We're very disciplined. And we are very conscientious in terms of what kind of impact we can, to, can have to help other people succeed in their lives. And we're particularly interested in Clevelanders and in the city of Cleveland, so we're very focused in this area. And when, when we started working with the City Club, it was the perfect form for us because it's a citadel of free speech. It's, an, it's, a, it's a safe place where there is civility in discussing any topic, and sharing views and empowering ourselves by learning from others. And individual empowerment and community empowerment is critically important to the success of the city. So we are very, very interested in doing this. And so many, many years ago, um, as Steve mentioned, Bob and his sister, Ellen Grease Cole, uh, established the Lucille and Robert Hayes Grease uh, Fund for the, perform the uh, cultural arts. And they did this because they were so, their parents were so dedicated to the vitality of the cultural arts in our community in terms of our quality of life here. And as you know, our, our, we are so rich in our culture because of those who have gone before us. So we wanted to honor them and to keep it going, keep it dynamic. And as we can see today, it is alive and well and Cleveland is thriving. Um, many years ago, not so many years ago, um, Bob and I started giving, our, rather than doing material gifts for birthdays, we decided to do charitable gifts uh, to commemorate our birthdays. And for one of my major birthdays, um, Bob gave me the forum for, um, for Women of Achievement. And um, it was very important to me because uh, I've been such a strong advocate for women, having faced my own, uh, dis fa faced discrimination through my own career. And I have worked very hard in advocacy for women, and so it thrills me when we can bring a talented woman like Janet Yellen in July uh, to come and to speak to us. Not only is she a role model, but she is a major, she is the major financial leader in the world today. And it, for us to have someone like that to be in our city, that we, she, we can learn from her and she can share her ideas with us is a wonderful thing, and thank God we have the City Club to do that. Um, Recently, my husband had a major birth birthday several years ago, and I decided that my husband is, is, is um, to a lot of us in the family and to other friends and family, is very inspirational. Here is a man who had chronic back pain and asthma. He had severe asthma. At the age of 51, because of medicine, he was able to start running. So he started with you know a mile, two miles, and then, as Steve mentioned, he ended up running 100 miles. And then he decided, well, you know, I might as well try biking. His first bike trip was the Gobi Desert, 1,000 miles. <laughs> and then he said, well, you know, maybe I ought to climb a mountain. So off he goes and he starts climbing mountains, not just 14ers, but 20,000 and higher. So, you know, so we thought, how can I bring this inspiration into Cleveland? And I thought the way to do this is to, to have Bob, um, to, to honor Bob this way. And we've had some incredible speakers, and I know Bob wants to share some stories on that, but but we, we had, we've had marvelous, um, marvelous people who inspire not only the adults, but also the children. I know Bob has a wonderful story for you, so I'd like Bob to come up now. I'm going to keep this very short because I know we're way over time, and there's no time for questions, probably. Uh, but thank you also, Steve, for that lovely introduction. I'm only going to tell you three things. 
of my contacts with the city club. One was a memorable occasion I will never forget. I've had a great life, had a lot of wonderful experiences, but about it was about 30, 40 years ago when I was asked to be the Friday Forum Speaker for the uh, philanthropy talk at the time. And that's something that has always stuck with me because speaking on this platform of free speech is a great thing. And I have never forgotten that and never will. Second thing I want to tell you is Sally and I have had experiences trying to bring people here as speakers and people still talk to us about the time when we brought our good friend Jim Tomey to be the speaker for the city club. And I might add, Dan, that in two or three years, when Jim becomes eligible uh, for the uh, uh, Cooperstown and will undoubtedly get in and all that, maybe we should do that again. <laughs> the third story, and oh, let me just digress one minute. Somebody mentioned the book, Five Generations. Uh, the book is not sold, so don't go to a library and try to find it. It's given away. And if you want, if anybody's interested in it, the Mons Museum of Jewish Heritage gives it away for nothing. Uh, just go in and ask for it if you're interested, and they'll give you one. It's a lot of Cleveland history as well as Jewish history, uh, Cleveland history, and a lot of stories, uh, some including the Cleveland Browns. Uh, now, the third thing and last thing I want to tell you is my great passion in the last number of years has been for people who I call my heroes, people who are born with great problems, great disabilities, great challenges in life, and go on to achieve amazing things. Uh, I think I came by that because of my 104 adventures, which I've done, uh, six of them have been with disabled riders. And I haven't got time to tell you about that. I'm writing a book about that right now. And that'll be out next year. But one of the great moments to me is trying to bring people here to the City Club who uh, have had these great achievements. And Dan and I worked for one year to bring here, when was it, a month ago, two months ago, mm -hmm. two months ago, a lady named Jennifer Bricker. And if you want to see an amazing story, Google her after this. I can't tell you the whole story. But she was a lady, she's now in her mid-20s, who was born with no legs and was given away by her parents at birth because they couldn't deal with it. And what did she do? She went on to become a star uh, in... Uh, not tumbling, uh, in, in gymnastics, and now goes all over the world as a performer in acrobatics and aerialists. Now, this person has the most positive view on life, and she doesn't do it with prosthetics, just like she was born, no legs. And she does these amazing things. What was an epiphany for me was to sit right here in this very room and to hear her talk to high school students. And their attitude, their reception, their questions, their reactions, and finally, some of the notes that I received from them through their teachers afterwards said that this was for them a life-changing experience that it taught them all kinds of new ways for the journey of life. So I'm hoping that I hang around for a few more years. I am 86 now, and I'm getting there, but I haven't caught up with you. <laughs> so I'm coming after you, Mira. Uh, but I hope to hang around for a few more years and see all the great things that this wonderful organization, the City Club, can do not just as informational or instructional or educational, 
but life-changing to the great people of our city of Cleveland. Thank you. You know, um, you talk about life-changing, Bob. You and, and Sally and Jim and Judge Capers and Phil, your father, have all changed the lives of so many uh, through your contributions here, and I thank you. I know we're, we are over time, as Bob said, so um, we probably will dispense with the Q&A, but we've got one more induction. And, you know, an, a, a moment like this is a moment when we reach back into our past and bring it into the present and, um, and really uh, recognize the contributions that, that people have made to keep our organization strong after 103 years. And today we're recognizing Ralph Hayes as well, who had my job in 1916. Um, and Jim mentioned him a little earlier when he, when he discussed the creed. And I just, it's funny, you know, when I first got here in the summer of 2013, we received a check from the estate of Ralph Hayes. And at the moment, the name sounded so familiar, but I, I couldn't place it. Who, who, who is that? And I asked around the office, and we all had this sort of collective amnesia about it. And the next day, I was thumbing through Tom Campbell's book uh, of the City Club History Freedoms Forum, and there he was. And, um, and he's somebody whose legacy has become something I ponder on a daily basis. Back in 1916, the title that, um, that the director had was Executive Secretary, and he was the second person to hold the position, and his tenure was relatively short, just a little more than two years, because before long, Cleveland's mayor, Newton D. Baker, also in our Hall of Fame, became Secretary of War and took Hayes with him to be his personal secretary in Washington. But he left this incredible imprint on our club. He wrote the creed, as Jim mentioned, and it's, uh, it's, I believe it's in your printed program, and you've no doubt come across it before on our website and in our books. And, you know, we spend a lot of time these days um, lamenting the political climate and the lack of civil discourse in the halls of power, sort of yearning for a time when it wasn't that way. I doubt there ever was such a time. Um, <laughs> I don't think it was really any better in the past because, after all, that's when people use phrases like, I have the minimum amount of high regard for my colleague from Michigan. <laughs> and I, I have to suspect that Hayes was motivated by the political climate around him when he penned the creed. It is every bit as relevant today as it was then, and I believe it's worth sharing now, and don't worry, it's relatively short. He wrote, in the voice of the City Club, he wrote, I hail and harbor and hear persons of every belief and party, for within my portals prejudice grows less and bias dwindles. I have a forum as wholly uncensored as it is rigidly impartial. Freedom of speech is graven above my rostrum and beside it, fairness of speech. I am the product of the people, a cross section of their community, weak as they are weak and strong in their strength, believing that knowledge of our failings and our powers begets a greater strength. I have a house of fellowship. Under my roof, informality reigns and strangers need no introduction. I welcome to my platform the discussion of any theory or dogma or reform, but I bind my household to the espousal of none of them, for I cherish the freedom of every person's conviction, and each of my kin retains his own or her own responsibility. This is my favorite part. You ready? I have no ax to grind, no logs to roll. My abode shall be the rendezvous of strong but open-minded men and women, and my watchword shall be information, not reformation. I am accessible to people of all sides, literally and figuratively, for I am located in the heart of the city, spiritually and geographically. I am the city's club, the city club. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to induct Ralph Hayes into the City Club Hall of Fame. Let's give his memory a big round of applause. I think given the late hour and the fact that it is um, a Monday and we do, most of us have work, um, I'm doing it now, yay. Um, <laughs> we, we will, I think, dispense with the Q&A. Our, our um, inductees, however, are gonna be here, and if you have questions for them, please harass them, come up and engage with them. Um, but I wanna congr congratulate all of you, our 2015 class of Hall of Fame inductees. Please, everybody, let's give everybody another round of applause.
All right, well, they've, they're leaving the stage, so our forum is now adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.